Hello again, my name is Professor Selby, as usual. I'm here talking today um, about the political theory of the American Foundation. Uh, specifically, we'll be looking at the Declaration of Independence. This is my first lecture on the different documents that make up the American Founding. And this is supplementary lecture to my lectures on political theory. So make sure you've been watching those lectures before you start uh, digging into what we have going on here. So founding, what do we mean by a founding, right? A foundation means the beginning of a political order. Here, think about my uh, history lecture, where we looked much more broadly at some social trends and places where the colonists came from and all of that. Um, all of that matters. What we're going to be looking at today and in this short series, though, is really the key documents that compose the period from the Declaration of, of uh, Independence through to the writing of the Constitution and the debates surrounding the Constitution. This lecture will just be on the Declaration of Independence, but there you go. Uh, people found lots of things. They found governments, businesses, uh, religious orders. So when we're talking about a foundation, it's a really common term. Um, so just keep that in mind. You know, we also have, as a reminder, uh, we'll get to that in a second, so what evidence do we have for thinking about the philosophy of the, the philosophy of the American founding? How are we going to sort of, what evidence can we appeal to to say, well, when the Constitution Declaration of Independence were written, were the people who wrote it thinking more like philosophical liberals or more like philosophical republicans? Okay, well, so we have different things we can appeal to. We can look at the text itself. Um, the text itself is pretty important. Um, we can also look at you know other key documents related to that text. So one of my lectures will be on the Federalist Papers, right? So the Federalist Papers, they're not actually part of the Constitution, but it's uh, Hamilton, Madison, and Jay saying, this is what we think the Constitution is doing. So they're kind of explaining for the general public uh, what you know how they view the Constitution. We can also look at the public debates. That's really what the Federalist Papers were. So the public debates that actually happened actually in newspapers and coffee houses and living rooms and town squares where, you know, people said, look, we have this new document. What does that mean? Should we adopt it? Should we not? And they're debating. You know, we can also, as my earlier history lecture did, look at, look at facts on the ground, social history type things of who were the people that came to the United States what, what did they tend to think in those types of things? Um, we don't, you know, I've already done that in my history lecture, so think back towards my history lecture as well. Now, again, philosophers also have foundations. So political orders have foundations. Houses have foundations. Philosophers also have foundations. Um, you know, remember that we're really looking at, in the case of America, only these two foundations, liberalism, and republicanism. So the founding fathers were largely philosophical liberals like John Locke or republicans like Aristotle, Montesquieu, or Tocqueville. So what did they really think about freedom? Well, you know, we can separate them out personality-wise a little bit. Benjamin Franklin, Alexander Hamilton, and James Madison are usually thought of as liberals, whereas Thomas Jefferson, the Anti-Federalist, and many others were more republican. So they're both there. It's really important to keep that in mind, okay? But let's let's take a look at the Declaration of Independence, okay? The first and most most important thing to notice is its strongly Lockean orientation, making it more philosophically liberal, right? Especially early on in the document, the Declaration of Independence reads almost exactly like John Locke, okay? So notice the very first sentence when in the course of human events it becomes necessary, da 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 da. This is really like the first paragraph of this thing is pretty amazing writing, actually, just on just on that uh, that front, you know. But notice this first sentence also appeals to natural law as the basis for why the colonists have the right to dissolve their government under certain conditions, and all of this is derived straight from luck, right? Um, you know, remember John Locke's second treatise was written as a defense of the Glorious Revolution. And big surprise that the ideas John Locke used to defend a domestic, 
uh, you know, in this case, I suppose, legitimate revolution were very helpful for the colonists to throw off the power of the British and to d justify their own revolution against the foreign power of the British, although I suppose they're only really foreign after the fact, right? So let's continue with the opening. Um, the second sentence here, even stronger perhaps Lockean themes, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. You know, look at our Locke readings. Locke frequently in those readings argues, you know, uses phrasing like liberties and estates, which I call by the life, liberties, and estates, there should be a life in there, which I call by the general name property. That's from uh, chapter nine of the ends of political society and government. That's the first sh very short reading that I gave you on John Locke, okay? Um, you know, so very strongly pulling from these themes in the second treatise. Okay, uh, continues that to secure these rights, right? Notice securing the rights. The rights are unalienable. You're not gonna be, you're not allowed to get rid of them. Someone else can enforce them for you but you're never, you're never, you never give them up. They always stay with you in some sense. And if someone else isn't enforcing them, you always get the right to enforce it yourself. That right always comes back to you. That to secure these rights, governments are instituted amongst men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. I mean, this is mega lock here. That whenever any form of government becomes destructive to these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or to abolish it and to institute a new government laying its foundations on such principles and organizing its power in such form as to them shall seem most likely to affect their safety and happiness, right? This is all super lock, except a little bit here where they're talking about right of the people because when they get into this right of the people stuff, they're starting to talk about collective self-determination more than individual rights. So again, this is a little bit of an example of how liberalism and, uh, and republicanism in the real world would kind of come together a little bit, uh, although analytically we want to keep them separate. Okay, so that's the setup, right? I mean, the thing's only like 500 words long. It's basically an editorial in the New York Times or, you know, Washington Post or whatever. But many or most of the list of grievances can be understood on a philosophically Republican foundation as well. Not that they should be, but they certainly can be, and perhaps it might be a little bit better to do it in that way. This is a harder one to say. But notice how the list of grievances that uh, make up the second part of the document all relate to practices of self-government, okay? So things like the king, they, they are mad that the king refuses to assent to laws. That means sign, much like our president, right? So they're passing all these laws. You know, if the king doesn't like a couple laws, he's certainly allowed not to sign, right? To effectively veto. It wasn't kind of understood in different terms at the time, but, you know, you know but he refuses to do any of them. He's just saying none of this. That's not really appropriate, right? You know, he refuses to call the legislatures into session. That was actually one of, of John Locke and his friends' biggest gripes against uh, the king during the Glorious Revolution was exactly that he refused to call parliament. Um, doesn't allow timely elections. Trying to monkey with the judicial system by having judges who he can fire at will. And then, of course, naturally, because the judges can be fired, they somehow managed to make rulings that are in his interest over and over and over again, right? All right, well, so, right, question arises, which is it? Which of these groups does a better job at making sense of this really key important text in, uh, the, American, in the American Foundation? Well, you know, that's always the hard question, right? Uh, in the real world, it's not always as easy to separate things out as it is when I get up there and I do a lecture and say, you know, everyone has a foundation and you start with your different foundations and then you move your way down and, you know, things are, you know, pretty tightly organized and you're like, oh, of course, that makes a lot of sense, right? Uh, in the real world, you know, people are trying to get things done. They're willing to 
use whatever arguments work, much more like a lawyer, you know, what argument will work here, not what's the right argument, maybe the right argument, meaning only that argument that works, um, not a particularly great criteria of rightness, but um, for most of us, most of the time, it's actually pretty good. Um, you know, um, the other thing to keep in mind here is that collective documents represent compromises amongst the multiple people who are the authors. So, you know, um, while there's distinctly this stronger sort of liberal feel to the Declaration of Independence, uh, you know, a collective document you should expect always to have sort of multiple voices in it. Um, honestly, individually written documents as, as well, you write a whole 300 page book, you probably didn't intend everything that got put in there. So anyways, let's, you know, so again, distinctly liberal in tone. Um, you know, part of this, just to like really emphasize the importance of um, the purpose of what you're writing, you know, uh, maybe this is due to the purpose of the document which it shares with Locke's second treatise, right? Revolution! Revolution, right? I mean, if you're trying to justify revolution, uh, some kind of natural law and natural rights argument really makes a lot of sense. Um, you know, it's important to remember Republicans can also talk about natural law and natural rights, but it might not come across quite as strongly in this case, okay? So what do we get? We get a lot of natural law, state of nature, and consent operating in the document in a pretty big way. Um, you know, but again, remember that the back of the, of the document has, you know, the list of grievances, which pretty much all seem to emphasize collective self-determination far more than individual rights, okay? Um, notice the vast majority have, have to do with actually making laws, not in individual rights per se. Although you can definitely understand that lawmaking element of the legislative through consent. I mean, that's, you know, what Locke did actually. So, um, you know, the, in this case, maybe the two arguments come together pretty closely when we're talking about making laws. Um, uh, but, you know, the American practice of self-government that were part, part of the actual political life of the colonies that I've talked about a little bit in my other lectures, um, that definitely is uh, strongly Republican in nature. So the list of grievances, you can sort of bring that Republican argument to the fore if you want. You don't have to if you stick to Locke's text pretty strongly. Um, the lawmaking function uh, is part of consent and operations of consent. So, you know, there you go. All right. Um, that's it. That's the end of this lecture. Uh, we'll pick up uh, with looking at the actual Constitution itself next.